I'm uh, Jesse Grizzle. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Michigan, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first morning keynote. So our speaker will be Professor David Aiken. He was a professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Maryland. He's the director of the Space Systems Laboratory. He got all of his degrees in these M places, so he's got MIT for bachelor's, master's, and PhD. He's at the University of Maryland, and he's got students, and he loves us here at the University of Michigan. So he's got a real M fetish, and we're very happy about that. He's active in the area of spacecraft design, space simulation, space systems analysis, and he's the author of many, many distinguished publications. So let's give a nice warm welcome to David. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I have been working with NASA my whole career, which means I can't talk without a set of uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, but I figure it's actually, um, I'm doing you a favor because you don't have to look at a giant me on the screen behind me. I think it's set up. Yeah, I, I actually figured they, they invited me because I'm, I can wear an, uh, I have my own tie that has M's all over it, so. Um, okay, so I wanted to uh, talk about space robotics, which I think is a really exciting field and it's something I've been working in for a lot of years. Um, we do a lot of cool stuff in space, but we, there's a lot more we could do, and there are some sort of uh, conventional wisdom that stands in our way, so I wanted to talk a little bit, bit about that too. So here's our hits and myths. Um, so I, I wanted to start off talking about, you know, sort of the grand vision, right? So in the, the common literature and in our, our entertainment, we're, we're used to the idea that when we go forth to explore the galaxy, it will be a teamwork of, you know, the, the intrepid human and the robot that helps them out. And, oh, that's not my slides. Where are my slides? I can't talk without slides. Oh, okay. How come that's, oh, here. Um, okay. Actually, I screwed up. I'm showing my age here. Um, so, the human, and it's the intrepid robot that helps him out. Sorry, I'm showing my age here. Okay, now I got it. The human and the intrepid robot that helps her out. Um, so, this whole idea of humans and robots as a team. It's a very powerful one, and it's one that we haven't really fully exercised yet, and that's sort of the focus of, of what I've been doing with most of my career. You know, you're probably very familiar with the uh, pictures of astronauts um, at the end of the remote manipulator system on the space shuttle or on space station doing work, and yes, it's a, it's a robot. It's um, not very exciting. It's about as exciting as watching a crane at a construction site. Um, so, the question is, how do we get to this idea of the human and the robot together, say, exploring the moon again in greater detail, or exploring Mars, or building giant structures and doing all kinds of wonderful things in orbital space? So first of all, let me talk about robots, because one of the, the, the factors if you listen to you know, pretty much any public relations person at NASA, they will talk about our brave robotic spacecraft. And uh, unfortunately, there's a tendency uh, to say that anything that doesn't have a human is a robot, which I actually maintain is not really a good definition. I think their definition is a robot interacts with and changes, purposely changes, the environment that it's in, right? So the, if you fly by a planet, with a spacecraft, you can take wonderful pictures, and and you and it's a uh, it's a remotely controlled spacecraft, but it's not a robot. I think the robot, like a human, has to reach out and touch something. So here's a great example: this uh, painting from uh, Apollo 12. Uh, in this case, the surveyor uh, spacecraft was a robot. It had the, if you see the pantographic arm there, it uh, it could reach out and scoop soil and the Apollo 12 astronauts landed close to it. So it explored the environment before the astronauts got there, and they actually went over and 
took pieces of it to see how uh, hardware would survive after uh, long term in space. Um, so the thing is, getting people to accept that robots are, are important has, all, has been a long slog you know, throughout my career. Uh, so my first myth is what I call the maximizing science myth, which is that any money or any mass you put into putting a robot on a mission is viewed by scientists as robbing them of science instruments, right? I could take that mass, I could put another instrument on it, I could discover stuff with this instrument, and then you're just going to put a stupid robot on it instead. That was sort of the, uh, what was happening in the mid-90s because I was involved with a program that wanted to put a robot on a mission that was going to Mars. So Mars Pathfinder, you know, these days you probably have seen when you, if those of you who are familiar with this, think of Pathfinder as this little six-wheeled vehicle. But Pathfinder was actually the big white thing with the pedals, right? It was going to be the, the first version of a weather station on Mars, and it was going to sit there. And so uh, this program said, okay, you have extra mass, let's put a robot on it. 25 pounds, $25 million, which is a tiny, tiny program for anything that, that uh, is you know, going to Mars. And the scientists were completely up in arms. No, we could put more instruments on it. Give us that money. We need that money. But as a technology experiment, it basically got created. And in, in less than three years, a Jet Propulsion Laboratory got this rover onto this um, Pathfinder spacecraft got to Mars, it actually landed with a bunch of balloons pop, popping around on the surface, and then the pedals unfolded, and the robot drove off. And the scientists discovered that this was the greatest thing ever. Right? So instead of just being able to have a camera and say, oh, look at this rock, look at that rock, they could say, I wonder what the backside of that rock looks like. And in fact, in this particular picture, the, uh, it's, the uh, rover is nestling up against this rock because on the back end of the rover was an alpha proton X-ray spectrometer. So the scientists could say not just what does this rock look like, but what's that rock made out of? And so it was a complete revolutionary <laughs> excuse me, concept that you could reach out and touch something. Completely change the minds of all of the planetary scientists. And in fact, in the next mission to Mars, they said, yeah, let's not do the whole lander thing, the, the, the fixed base. We'll just do the robot. And so the Mars exploration robots were designed to carry all the instruments that were on the fixed base before. And uh, it was supposed to last for 90 souls, 90 Martian days. Um, and there were some fantastic arguments, I remember, when we were doing the design for this, because the scientists were still saying, yeah, OK, we want the rover because we want to drive to a rock. But we don't want to spend time driving. We want to spend all of our time looking at the rocks. And we're saying, no, no, it's also a technology experiment. Let's drive. And so you, know, you have a set of requirements, a set of mission guidelines. And so we said, all right, we're flying two rovers. If the two rovers together can drive a kilometer, Let's call that mission success. No, no, no. We don't care about driving. We don't want to drive. Um, you know, we're only going to last for 90 Martian days, and we don't want to spend all our, waste all our time driving. If I can drive to a rock that's 10 feet away, I could spend 90 days looking at that rock and be totally happy. We got, no, no, you want to drive. All right, so it turns out that we are now um, 4,380 days, Martian days, past the 90 souls that these, these rovers were supposed to last, and Opportunity, one of them, is still driving. And together, the two rovers have driven over 50 kilometers on Mars. So they've explored parts of Mars. They have, they, when they landed, they looked at the hills in the distance and said, those are really cool, but we're never going to make it there. And now they've driven over the hills, and they're on the other side of the hill. So. Uh, rovers are pretty cool. Um, and this is also the first time you could really reach out and touch something. The instrument deployment device has four different instruments on the end. One of them is a rock abrasion tool that lets you cut a hole in the surface of the rock and see what the elemental particles are underneath. And of course, it, that causes a little bit of concern 
Um, this was a, uh, a what happens if this happens sort of video. So you can see that it's supposed to basically just cut a hole in the rock. <laughs> Fortunately, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and in fact, so Mars uh, Exploration Rovers, Opportunity and, or, and Spirit, uh, landed on a very simple lander that they had to drive off of. And so the next one with the Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity, um, the JPL engineer said, yeah, you know, this whole lander thing, we, we don't really think we need that. You know, the, the strongest part of a rover are the wheels. And certainly, those of you at first know about wheels this year, especially driving over all of those obstacles and so forth. Go Team 2537, my team. Um, anyway, so they said, let's do this sky crane thing where we will lower it from a flying robot and then have the, the sky crane fl uh, fly away, and we will start off on our wheels. And that worked beautifully. Uh, so uh, Curiosity is now three, some, three or four years into its mission in Gale Crater. And it's learned to take selfies. Uh, unlike your selfie where you can just hold the camera out, they're holding the camera out too, but the camera has a focal, uh, uh, has a field of view of about half a degree. So they actually have to hold the camera out and take something like 150 different pictures and then photo mosaic them together to get a picture like this. In fact, they actually do it. What I think is really cool about it is as they do it, they move the arm around so you don't see the arm. So you look at it and say, oh my god, the arm's moving, the arm's missing. But it's actually just the way that they do the photo mosaicing. Um, the wheels, I, I love this story of the wheels. Um, one of the things that was discovered back in the days of Pathfinder was if you look at the tracks the wheels make in the soil, it causes, you learn a lot. You can tell what the constituency of the soil is. Uh, um, I actually teach a graduate course in planetary surface mobility, and you can look at those tracks and you can understand how the soil reacts to the weight on it. Um, and the, also, they uh, used uh, visual odometry to see how far they've come. So they, they wanted to put a pattern in, in the, the grousers and in, in the uh, wheels themselves. And so in the prototype, they had JPL embossed in the wheels. And as, you, as they drove across the surface, it would leave JPL, 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 JPL. And NASA had, of course, no, no, this is not a JPL mission, this is a NASA mission. And JPL said, well, we need to have something. What if we just had some holes or something so we could identify where we're, where we're embossed uh, each time? And they said, yeah, that'd be okay, but no JPL. So they put this pattern of holes. This is actually a picture taken by Curiosity on the surface of Mars. Um, and um, what they acknowledged after the launch was if you look at the holes and the, the spaces between the holes, it's actually Morse code that spells out JPL, JPL, JPL. <laughs> uh, one of the really interesting things, uh, we lost Spirit because, both Spirit and Opportunity have had trouble because they drive into sand dunes and they can't get out of the sand. Um, and so they decided with curiosity, all right, avoid sand dunes, just drive on rocks. And they have discovered that driving on rocks has its own problem. This is actually a test fixture uh, in the Mars Yard at JPL and you can kind of get an idea that these wheels are not pristine. In fact, uh, this is what it looks like. And the wheels on Curiosity on Mars are basically starting to shred because of driving on rocks. And now they're starting to say, OK, let's not drive on rocks. Let's go back to the sand dunes. So it's, it's always uh, a problem figuring out exactly what the best way is to navigate a robot on another planet. And in terms of reaching out and touch something, you can't argue with a robot that has its own death ray. So they've got a, LIBS is, is a laser-induced breakdown spectrometry, and they have this laser that will zap the surface within about 10 meters of the robot, and they can look at the excitation of the particles that are vaporized by the laser, and they can tell without even going over to the, to the, the site what the, un, the constituents of the, um, that sample are. So all robots should have lasers. OK, um, another problem that's, that we've had in, in the space robotics business 
is what I call the kitchen sink myth, which is we're only going to get one shot at this, so we've got to make it work. So let's put everything we can imagine on the robot. Let's have this robot do absolutely everything, and, and oh, by the way, because it's going to be so expensive, let's make it work for 30 years with no maintenance. And by the time you do that, you run into trouble. Uh, in the early days of, this, of the space station program, uh, Congress actually wrote into an appropriation that NASA should spend 10% of the money of space station on robotics, which, you know, those of us who do robots for a living, we're like, yay, this is great. You know, it's a really expensive program. That's like, me. You know, $100 billion program, $10 billion for robotics, life is good. Um, well, NASA basically decided, no, you didn't really mean 10% 10 10 of the space station money. You spent, you meant 10% of the research portion of the space station money, which is much, much smaller. So, that, But they did create a program called Flight Teller Robotic Servicer, which is the poster child of the kitchen sink myth, because Again, it was going to be able to do everything that astronauts do, and it was going to work on station for uh, 30 years and never have to be maintained and never have to be serviced. Uh, the one on the left was from Grumman. The one on the right was from uh, Martin Marietta, now part of Lockheed. That was the one that won. And as they went through, the feature creep destroyed the program. So by the time it got up to about a billion dollars, uh, they basically said, yeah, we should cancel this. Um, which actually, um, if you were ever to Google me online, you will discover that my only claim to notoriety really is Aiken's Laws of Spacecraft Design, which I create for my students in spacecraft design. Uh, but I, I have branched out into robot design. And one of my laws of robot, space robots is the maturity of the design is inversely proportional to the length to diameter ratio of the arm. So when you see these images with these tiny little toothpick arms, you know it doesn't exist except in the mind of a technical illustrator. And as you get more, closer and closer to flight, the arms become fatter and fatter and fatter and shorter. So this is actually the Flight Teller Robotic Service or Manipulator, which is really the only piece of the program that was completed by the time they were canceled. But it turned into a really beefy arm. Um, the, one of the biggest problems, at least around NASA, has been this chicken and egg problem, which is you say, we need to build robots. And they'll say, well, show us the program that has a requirement for robots. And then you go to the programs and say, you could do this better with a robot. You should have a requirement. And they say, but there's no robot. If I write in a requirement for a robot and there isn't one, they'll build one and they'll take my money to do it. I'm not going to do that. So it's really been a problem trying to break through and say, here's a robot. See what you can do. In fact, one of the things I, I love to tell my students, um, you know, doing teaching systems engineering, there's a, a principle in systems engineering that says everything is done to requirements, right? You have to have a requirement, and you design the system to the requirements. The truth is, it doesn't work that way all the time. And the example I love, you know, since we're, you're going to see a lot of uh, rotorcraft today with uh, Michigan Robotics, is uh, Igor Sikorsky spent 30 years of his life trying to develop a helicopter. The reason he was developing the, the helicopter was that his vision for it, his requirement, was it was going to replace the automobile. Right, we were all going to have helicopters in our garages, and we would commute to work by helicopter, and we wouldn't have to have roads because we would fly everywhere we wanted to go. Now, traffic boggles the mind in this case, but if you think about it, never happened. Every single use of the helicopter we have today came into existence because someone looked at a helicopter and said, hey, I could use that. And robots are kind of that way, too. We need to get robots active so people can say, hey, I can use that. Um, we actually had a program a number of years ago um, under NASA support. This is at the University of Maryland, uh, where we were going to build a small, you know, small sats. CubeSats are very big in space right now. And this was you know, probably 20 years ahead of its time. We were going to build a very small robot that we could fly on a very small launch vehicle like Pegasus and demonstrate on-orbit satellite servicing for a very small sum of money. Um, which, 
as things go, morphed into a, a robot that was going to fly on the space shuttle. Unfortunately, after the Columbia accident, NASA no longer flew this category of payloads, so we never got a chance to fly. But our Ranger system, we feel very proud of, that it basically can do pretty much everything an astronaut in a spacesuit can do. Um, and it's, it was certified for flight on the shuttle. It was actually the, the first American-made robot ever to be certified for flight and operation on the space shuttle. Unfortunately, there's another problem getting stuff into space which is space is expensive, and as a NASA administrator once remarked in a group I was, it was in, you should take risks, but we look bad on, in the newspapers and on TV if you fail, so don't fail. Take risks, but don't fail. Um, and so one of the ways that that is implemented is, that, is saying we should fly technology that we know works. And, but that translates to you can't fly your robot in space until you've already flown your robot in space. Once you've flown your robot in space, then you can fly it, which makes it tough. Um, after the Columbia accident, NASA announced that uh, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board said, you know, to fly a shuttle to the Hubble Space Telescope, it's a different orbit than space station. Um, you can't get back from I just realized the clock on my podium is not running. Uh, you can't, you, if something goes wrong like the, like the Columbia accident, there's no recourse. The astronauts are going to die like the Columbia astronauts. Maybe you shouldn't send astronauts to do the last Hubble servicing mission. Maybe you should send a robot. And I start jumping up and down because I've been building robots for 20 years and every single one of them was based on b repairing Hubble Space Telescope because it is the fiducial case. Right? We have all this experience on astronauts repairing Hubble Space Telescope, and we can do it with robots and understand how robots are similar to humans and how robots are different from humans, and what ro humans do best and what robots do best. So, and I said, hey, I've got this robot that NASA paid for that was going to fly in the shuttle and is sitting in a closet. And I went down to Naval Research Labs, and they had an upper stage that NASA paid for that was going to fly to space station but then the Russians came through with their promises, and it's sitting in a box. And I said, we can do this. You've paid for the hardware. We'll do it. But they said, no, no, you haven't flown the robot in space before, so you can't fly it. But they did say, oh, but you have the, your beautiful uh, uh, neutral buoyancy tank at the University of Maryland, and you have this robot. Make the robot look like the Canadian robot we're going to uh, uh, buy, because that way we will know if it works, because the Canadian robot doesn't work on the ground. Uh, they do all of their, their training through simulation, not through, through computer simulation. So we said, okay, so we modified our robot to look like the Special Purpose Dexter's Manipulator and spent, put uh, the, the same hardware that the astronauts train on for service in Hubble in my tank, and for a period of about five months, did every task that they were expecting humans to do with the robot. So this is our robot. Uh, I love this configuration. We had to triple the length of the arms. We had to double the length of the positioning leg. We used to joke, the tank is 50 feet across, and we used to joke, how do you know you're in the workspace of the robot? And for those of you who don't know, it's a bad idea to be in the workspace of a robot. And the joke was, if you're wet, you're in the workspace of the robot. Because the arms, when you were stretched out like this, were 30 feet from fingertip to fingertip. And we were doing t things that astronauts do. Um, which leads to the anthropocentrism myth, which is that robots can't do what a human can do. And the truth is, robots can do an awful lot of what a human can do. Um, this is um, a mock-up of the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which is an instrument in the axial compartment of Hubble Space Telescope. That's the big uh, box on the right-hand side. It's about the size of a telephone booth, and I apologize, the young people in the room probably don't know what telephone booths are. But there used to be a place you go went into to talk on telephones. Um, so anyhow, to insert this into the optical path, so if you look at the bottom edge on the, in the picture on the side facing you, and the, imagine the top edge diagonally opposite on the side away from you in the picture, those two edges each have to be lined up to within 50 thousandths of an inch to insert it into the optical path of the telescope. And we were doing that routinely with robots day in and day out. And 
There was an administration change at NASA. The new administrator came in and without even getting a briefing saying, looked at the robotic service, Hubble servicing program and said, that's stupid. Humans can't do what, or robots can't do what humans do and canceled the program and flew a, one last human servicing mission, which thankfully was very uh, successful. Um, we have done a lot of work down through the years in looking at robots and humans working together. And this actually is, dates to the mid-1980s, uh, where we were doing uh, servicing tasks on Hubble, um, and we had one of our early robots, the Beam Assembly Teleoperator, or BAT, which was just serving as um, an assistant. And you know, one of the things is, even if you accept the premise that robots can't do what humans do, the truth is they can do a lot of things that help humans do what they do well. Um, we actually have done an exhaustive survey of everything it takes to service Hubble Space Telescope. And it, I can tell you definitively that our robots have demonstrated of the 2,440 separate activities to service Hubble Space Telescope, we have demonstrated 92% of those activities with our robots. There are some that are really, really hard. And one of the things I've, I, I like to tell people is, you know, if, if you want a robot that does 90% of what a human can do, that's not too tough. If you want to get to 95%, the cost goes up by a factor of 10. If you want to go to 97 and a half, the cost goes up by another factor of 10. If you want to go to whatever, 99 minus epsilon percent, the cost goes up by another factor of 10. So it's ultimately, you're basically asymptotically approaching a human, but it gets harder and harder and harder from the standpoint of dexterity and uh, manipulability and things like that. But even short of that, just having a simple robot to help humans is very, very powerful. We actually call this scrub nurse mode, because if you think about going into the hospital for an operation, the doctor is not the person preparing the patient for operation and scrubbing the, the wounds and laying out the instruments and all of that. You have highly trained, but differently trained people, the surgical nurses, who do that in preparation for the surgeon to come in and actually do the cutting and surgery. And robots can fill the, the surgical nurse mode very, very well, because there are things they do um, very easily that relieve the human of having to do that. Uh, one of the things we've demonstrated is what happens if a human is incapacitated? What would happen if a human passed out um, in a suit doing some an extravehicular activity, a spacewalk? And we've demonstrated having a robot fly up to a person who is pretending to be incapacitated. NASA makes me promise, I would never say this, except for, the, without using the word, pretending to be incapacitated because astronauts do not become incapacitated. Uh, but anyway, so we have a person pretending to be incapacitated in a suit. The uh, robot gen gently grabs them, takes them back to the uh, simulated space shuttle airlock, and locks them in so they can be repressurized and saved by the crew inside. And so the idea of robotic lifeguards, I think, is a very powerful one. And when you have a very small number of people, and they're all very expensive to put into space, protecting them with robots is a great idea. Um, this is one of the highlights of my career. There are no robots in this picture. Um, well, actually, there is. So on the right-hand side, that's the remote manipulator system. But in this particular case, this you know, incredibly expensive Canadian six-degree freedom remote manipulator system was a camera platform. That little gold box was a camera we were using. We just said, park it there and watch. Anyway, so two astronauts, Jerry Ross and Woody Spring, went outside on a space shuttle mission and took these, this tubular structure that we built in my laboratory and assembled it repeatedly so we could actually measure the performance of humans doing structural assembly in space. Cool experiment. Get to fly on the shuttle is really cool. Um, so we did similar things, not just in the, in the water tanks, but also looking at how humans and robots would collaborate, right? So you can collaborate. Now, one of the things about humans and robots, at least at our current level of capabilities, is that robots are kind of like your four-year-old, right? If you're working on your car and your four-year-old says, I want to help daddy, then you say, sure, you can help. 
and give her things to do, but you're not actually letting her take apart the car. And uh, because, you know, she would be a lot slower at it. Um, and it turned out, as we were looking at this, this was actually a concept uh, before the current International Space Station of a Space Station Freedom had a truss structure that was manually assembled in orbit. So we were looking at how the, a robot could help astronauts. The, you can see in the background the two people in spacesuits. And you notice they're not side by side working together. That's because the robot is glacially slow. And we actually want to sort of evolving, treating the robot like a four-year-old. They come over and say, OK, I'm ready for the next stop. And you give them a piece, and they go off to their place, and they work on their stuff. And then you work on your stuff, and then they come back and ask for another piece later. So we're still at the level where robots are not the equivalent of humans. They can do the same things humans could do, but they can't do it as rapidly. One of the things that actually really um, highlighted that when I was involved with the Mars Exploration Rovers is um, I was having a beer with Steve Squires one day, and, and uh, Steve is the principal investigator of Mars Exploration Rovers, and I said, Steve, you are a trained field geologist. So if you think about what your rovers do in a day on Mars, if you were out in the field, how long would it take you to do that? And he thought about it and said, about 45 seconds. So a day of a robot's time is 45 seconds of a field geologist's time. So I have evolved the Squires number, SQ for short, which is currently 240. Because if you compare 45 seconds to the three hours the robot actually operates on Mars because of limitations of power and uh, thermal environment, a human can do 240 times what a, a robot can do in today's um, technology. And in fact, what was interesting, I first asked him that question before we ever launched the, the rovers. And I, I ran into him again a couple of years ago, since after, say, 10 years of oper operations on Mars. And I said, so you want to revise your estimate? He said, no. I'm still growing with 45 seconds. Because the robots haven't actually gotten faster, we've gotten better at controlling them. But they, they are limited by their inherent capabilities. Um, this was some work we did. One of the things we do is build spacesuits as well as robots. And while we had, oh, this wasn't actually what NASA was looking at us for, but while we had Hubble Space Telescope in our tank, I said, let's do some tests of how our robots, which are pretty capable dexterous robots, could interact with a, a simulated astronaut, grad student, um, in the suit to, to service Hubble. And we're doing a battery change out here. Um, and I, I, I know it, you're not supposed to show data at uh, events like this, but I, I love this chart, so I just wanted to show it. If you look at astronauts in the first Hubble servicing mission, they were outside for five days and on average, they spent six hours and 15 minutes each time that they were outside. And so that's the red line. Unfortunately, we don't have lasers. Um, so if you look at the red line, that's the, the average that they spent when they were outside over the course of, of the mission. And so we looked at all of those tasks in great detail and divvied them up and said, OK, is this a robot task or is this a human task? And if it's a robot task, is it a task the robot does before the humans go out the airlock? Is it a task that robots do with the humans? Or is it a task that the robots do after the end of the day when the humans are back inside and they're taking off their spacesuits and they're eating dinner and the robot's finishing up stuff? And allocated all of those tasks to all of those things over all of those days. And we discovered that the amount of time you needed humans outside in the spacesuit drop by half if you gave them a fairly capable dexterous robot as an assistant. Now, SM2, like SM3B, servicing mission one, servicing mission 3B, servicing mission four, were all very, a lot of custom stuff, a lot of you know fine dexterous manipulation. So there's still a lot of things we really need humans for. If you look at some of the simpler Hubble servicing missions, like the second one or, or the 3A, there's kind of plug and play uh, pull out a box, put it in a new box. We actually, on those missions, showed that we could get the requirement for human down by 80%. So what NASA spent 
five days of astronauts outside working on, we could do was one day outside if we had robots to supplement the, the humans. Um, this one is probably the worst myth to contend with that I've ever encountered in my entire career. Um, for those of you who, who have read Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, he postulated that the perfect invisibility field was to have a device that would exude the aura of somebody else's problem. And if you, if you look at something and it's somebody else's problem, you don't see it. And I think the somebody else's problem myth is very big in robotics. And the, what is stated is robots are so important, we don't have to worry about it. Somebody else is going to do it. It's somebody else's problem. And time has shown that that doesn't always work. Right? If there are things, you know, we're going to hear an awful lot today about robots that have, you know, real importance and things like surveillance and uh, military um, explosive ordnance uh, disposal and things like that. And all of those are things that have good profit making potential behind them. But space robots are paid for by NASA, pretty much nobody but NASA. And they are somewhat uniquely different. So what are the things we could do if NASA said, yeah, let's go for this. Let's do more robots. So these, some of these are things we have done and would like to do more of. Some of them are things that you know, could be done. Um, the hardest thing working in a spacesuit, and I have like 300 hours in spacesuits, is working with your hands and your wrists. Because you're inside a pressurized glove, and you have to uh, move the glove to follow you. Um, and in fact, we've actually shown from our flight data that if you look at the whole astronaut, the whole person, three quarters of the, of the physiological energy, three quarters of the work an astronaut does goes into moving the suit. Only about a quarter of their work goes into doing the job they're supposed to be doing. And the gloves are, are really the hardest part of that. Opening and closing your hand a lot is a killer. Astronauts will train for a year before a mission to build up the strength in their hands. Uh, spacesuit gloves don't bend at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. They don't bend at, this, at your knuckles. They only bend up here in the middle of the fingers. Because you can't make a spacesuit glove with a passive joint that you can spend the energy to bend. So we worked with IOC Dover, which is a company that makes spacesuits for NASA, and they built a glove that had an MCP joint, but it took 16 pounds of force to actuate it. Then we built a robotic actuator and an adaptive nonlinear observer that went with it and basically nullified the forces of the glove so that you could use that degree of freedom in your hand that you never had before. Um, there are a lot of ways we think that humans and robots are going to become closer and closer in terms of, you know, someone uh, this morning talked about exoskeletons and we've done medical rehabilitation exoskeletons for the Army. but Ultimately, you'd like to be able to give the astronaut capabilities beyond what they could have just as, as a normal shirt-sleeved human. Uh, space utility vehicles have been around as a concept, although not pursued very often. The one on the left, the one on the right is actually my, my poster child for Aiken's Law about long skinny arms, and those are actually cardboard arms. Uh, this, that was done by a, a group down in NASA Huntsville. The one on the left is a concept that, that came out of um, actually my senior capstone design course, and where you have robotic systems and the ability to use your hands, because astronauts excel at eyes and hands. So keeping astronauts hands on, we think, is important. Making robots smaller. If we can make robots smaller and therefore cheaper, we could have a lot more of them. And we've been pushing the boundaries. If the arms I talked about that we use for the, we're going to do on the space shuttle flight weighed 180 pounds apiece. This arm can do everything that one does, and this arm weighs six pounds. So by getting the manipulators lighter in weight and maintaining the capability of making them smaller, putting them on smaller vehicles, um, we believe that you actually can really close a business case for commercial satellite servicing in orbit. And We've done a lot of studies of that and have shown that it's a three to five billion dollar a year potential market. If you could go up and service a satellite, if you, your servicing robot is small enough that it doesn't cost you 
an arm and a leg to go. If you have to fly a robot that's the same size as the satellite you're working on, then you're launching it on the same launch vehicle as the satellite you're working on, and you're better off just launching a new satellite. Um, having small vehicles would help astronauts, right? It's not just servicing Hubble. There's a lot of things on space station. There's a lot of things on the way to Mars um, that robots could help astronauts with in terms of all the stuff that they need to do. Um, at, NASA has been interested in a while on asteroids. Um, to me, the most interesting asteroids we can imagine exist in orbit around Mars. They're called Phobos and Deimos, and they are the moons of Mars. They are sort of the perfect advance bases for human exploration of Mars. And since they appear to be carbonaceous chondrites, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they're loaded with water. And if they're loaded with water, then you have rocket propellants and you have life support hard, uh, consumables. Um, so how do you, but the, the problem with asteroids is they have very little gravity and they don't come equipped with handrails. So Euclid, the little free-flying uh, space, uh, spacecraft on the left in our neutral buoyancy tank, has actually, we have an asteroid simulator, Euclid actually deployed all of these ropes, these lines, that let my grad student in the spacesuit simulator maneuver hand over hand on the asteroid. So being able to have a robot that could set it up so that humans have mobility and security exploring asteroids or exploring the moons of Mars could be really powerful. Um, NASA supporting a group in Hawaii called Hi Seas, um, where they have, you can see off to the right, the dome. Um, they actually, at 8,000 feet elevation on the side of Mauna Loa, they've been doing a series of isolation tests where six crew stay for extended periods of time, four months, then eight months, and the current crew is in, is in there for a year, simulated a Mars mission. And anytime they go outside, they have to wear a simulated spacesuit. And uh, what they're wearing here is a suit that we developed for them. But I'm actually showing this picture as a, why in the world are you doing that, right? I hope we never send astronauts outside on Mars with a shovel. shovel. That's not a good purpose for a person. That's not a good thing to do for a person in a spacesuit. That's a good thing to do with a robot being directed by a human. Um, I love this picture. This is actually quite recent, from about two weeks ago. Um, one of the things we're really interested in for lunar exploration or Mars exploration are lava tubes, because the radiation environment is of great concern. And if we could find a lava tube where lava had flowed through, the, it is basically solidified, and it's an easy access into the subterranean air areas where you could establish a habitat and not have to worry about radiation, you could really you know, revolutionize extended exploration of either the moon or Mars. So the area that they're at in uh, Hawaii is covered with lava tubes. Uh, again, one of their, their uh, um, simulated astronauts have been, has climbed down here in our spacesuit I think it's a great picture. I think it ought to be a robot, or maybe a robot helping them. Uh, this is some work we've done with Arizona State, not nearly as cool as lava tubes in Hawaii. We don't get to go to Hawaii. Only our spacesuits get to go to Hawaii. I'm very sad. Uh, but we built the robot and put Arizona State scientists, uh, geologists in them, and did a lot of exploration. Um, is this a robot? Well, actually, it kind of is, because one of the things that's tough in a spacesuit is getting access to information. And you'd like to be able to do, you know, these days nobody thinks twice about whipping the phone out of your pocket and looking up things on the phone. You can't do that in a spacesuit. So um, uh, Kip Hodges here, who's actually the um, dean of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at um, Arizona State and also a field trained, geolog a trained field geologist, um, is wearing a, a setup that in our, one of our suits. And it's a head-mounted display that flips up automatically out of your vision. So it looks like all of the cheesy board movies on TV, but it works because you, can get, you can't reach into your helmet to move it, but you can hit a button and get it out of your visual field or drop it down when you need to look at it. Um, the old paradigm, which to some extent still exists at NASA, is robots versus humans, right? And if you think about the things I've talked about today, you know, the places we've really had hits are things like... Um, sending robots to Mars, because we can't send humans there now. Um, and the places that where NASA uses humans now 
they don't have a lot of robotics because humans are expensive and they spend all their money on them. Um, so the, the robot on the left is Robonaut built by uh, uh, Johnson Space Center. Uh, it kind of looks like they're facing off. But I think the real bottom line that I would, I would propose here is that the best way to do things in space are teams of humans and robots working together. You know, robots working before the humans get there, robots working with the humans, and continuing to work if the humans leave. Um, but it makes the humans so much better. It lets the humans focus on the things they do best, and the robots can focus on the things they do best. It's a great team. So with that, I will say thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation, and I've enjoyed talking to you.